I only have a moment, but I wanted you to see a picture of Betelgeuse, that's what it's called, in the constellation Orion, the first image of the surface of another star. But the most exciting recent stellar discovery has been of a nearby supernova in a companion galaxy to the Milky Way. We are here witnessing chemical elements in the process of synthesis and have had our first glimpse of the supernova through a brand new field, neutrino astronomy. And we're now seeing, around neighboring stars, disks of gas and dust just like those needed to explain the origin of the planets in our solar system. Worlds may be forming here. It's like a snapshot of our solar system's past. And there are so many such disks being found these days that planets may be very common among the stars of the Milky Way. Except for planetary exploration, the study of galaxies and cosmology, what this episode was about, have undergone the greatest advances since Cosmos was first broadcast. For one thing, at last we have a good photograph of our own Milky Way galaxy, about 100,000 light years across. Here it is. It was taken by NASA's COBE satellite. We see it edge on, of course, since we're embedded in the plane of the galaxy. But you don't need a spacecraft to see it. If it's a clear night tonight, why not go out and take a look at the Milky Way? There's also new evidence suggesting that the Milky Way is not so much an ordinary spiral galaxy as a barred spiral, like this. Important work has now been done on mapping how the galaxies are scattered through intergalactic space. To the surprise of a lot of scientists, on a scale of hundreds of millions of light years, the galaxies turn out not to be strewn at random or concentrated in clusters of galaxies, but instead strung out along odd, irregular surfaces, like this. Every dot in this computer animation is a galaxy. The computer lets us look at this distribution of galaxies from many points of view, but this is how it looks from the Earth. There's uh, an odd mannequin shape that is uh, presented by the distribution of galaxies. This work has been done mainly by Margaret Geller with her collaborator John Huckra at Harvard University and the Smithsonian Institution. It's a little like uh, soap bubbles in a bathtub or in dishwashing detergent. The galaxies are on the surfaces of the bubbles. The insides of the bubbles seem to have almost no galaxies in them at all. An average bubble is about 100 million light years across. And that means that we've mapped still only a very small volume of the accessible universe, the galaxies nearest to us. But pretty soon, we should be able to extend this search out to enormous distances, out to distances so far away in space that we're looking back to the time that galaxies and their structures were first forming. And this poses a real problem. Most cosmologists hold that the galaxies arise from a pre-existing lumpiness in the early universe with little lumps growing into galaxies. But the background radiation from the Big Bang that fills all of space has now been carefully measured by that same COBE satellite that, uh, that took that picture. Now those radio waves seem almost perfectly uniform across the sky, as if the Big Bang weren't lumpy or granular at all. But if the early radiation and matter in the universe weren't lumpy, how could individual galaxies form? How could the bubbles form? Is there a contradiction between the uniformity of the Big Bang radio waves and the bubble structures formed by the galaxies? That's the question. When our survey of the galaxies reaches out to billions of light years, we'll have the answer to this question. Incidentally, maybe you're thinking that uh, the bubbles imply a bubble maker. But then I'd have to ask you, 
who made the bubble maker? There's another infinite regress lurking here. And to one of the grandest questions, whether there's enough matter in the universe to close it, the only fair answer is that we still don't know. If it is closed, what is the hidden matter that's closing it? Is it faint stars, black holes, massive neutrinos, some exotic kind of dark matter unknown on Earth? We don't know. But there are reasons to think that we'll soon find out the answers. Since Cosmos was first released, interest in UFOs has persisted. It seems to me that there are fewer sightings of strange objects in the skies these days, and more stories about uh, personal encounters with alleged extraterrestrials, like the account of Betty and Barney Hill that we, uh, that we dramatized. There are still people who claim to have been abducted by aliens, or, or even sexually abused, or even impregnated by them. Best-selling, purportedly serious books have been written about such claims. But the critical fact remains that all we have still is just anecdote. There are no close-up photographs, no artifacts, nothing that would convince a skeptic. All there are is stories. And stories just aren't good enough on a matter of this importance. I'm still waiting for hard evidence. The radio search for extraterrestrial intelligence has been uh, picking up. In Harvard, Massachusetts, a radio telescope monitoring eight million separate radio channels has been scanning the skies for signals. This program called META is supported entirely by the Pasadena, California-based Planetary Society, paid for by members' contributions. A similar Planetary Society search to examine the southern skies, including the center of the Milky Way galaxy, is to be performed in Argentina. These searches are by far the most sophisticated ever attempted. A much more sensitive program covering almost the entire accessible radio spectrum is to be mustered by NASA. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is central to our understanding of the universe and our view of ourselves. It's well worth doing. But the simple fact is that while we may consider extraterrestrial intelligence highly likely, there is as yet no evidence at all that it exists. The search continues. The greatest thrill for me in reliving this adventure has been not just that we've completed the preliminary reconnaissance with spacecraft of the entire solar system. And not just that we've discovered astonishing structures in the realm of the galaxies. But especially that some of Cosmos's boldest dreams about this world are coming closer to reality. Since this series' maiden voyage, the impossible has come to pass. Mighty walls that maintained insuperable ideological differences have come tumbling down. Deadly enemies have embraced and begun to work together. The imperative to cherish the earth and to protect the global environment that sustains all of us has become widely accepted. And we've begun, finally, the process of reducing the obscene number of weapons of mass destruction. Perhaps we have, after all, decided to choose life. But we still have light years to go to ensure that choice, even after the summits and the ceremonies and the treaties. There are still some 50,000 nuclear weapons in the world. And it would require the detonation of only a tiny fraction of them to produce a nuclear winter the predicted global climatic catastrophe that would result from the smoke and the dust lifted into the atmosphere by burning cities and petroleum facilities. The world scientific community has begun to sound the alarm about the grave dangers posed by depleting the protective ozone shield and by greenhouse warming. And again, we're taking some mitigating steps. 
But again, those steps are too small and too slow. The discovery that such a thing as nuclear winter was really possible evolved out of studies of Martian dust storms. The surface of Mars, fried by ultraviolet light, is also a reminder of why it's important to keep our ozone layer intact. The runaway greenhouse effect on Venus is a valuable reminder that we must take the increasing greenhouse effect on Earth seriously. Important lessons about our environment have come from spacecraft missions to the planets. By exploring other worlds, we safeguard this one. By itself, I think this fact more than justifies the money our species has spent in sending ships to other worlds. It is our fate to live during one of the most perilous and at the same time one of the most hopeful chapters in human history. Our science and our technology have posed us a profound question. Will we learn to use these tools with wisdom and foresight before it's too late? Will we see our species safely through this difficult passage so that our children and grandchildren will continue the great journey of discovery still deeper into the mysteries of the cosmos? That same rocket and nuclear and computer technology that sends our ships past the farthest known planet can also be used to destroy our global civilization. Exactly the same technology can be used for good and for evil. It is as if there were a God who said to us, I set before you two ways. You can use your technology to destroy yourselves or to carry you to the planets and the stars. It's up to you. <laughs>